Hello, my name's Craig Neem, and I'm the current head of HFW's shipping group. And I'm George Eddings. I've been working at HFW for the last 35 years in our shipping group. I've been working in our Hong Kong office, uh, also in our London office, and I, like Craig, I've been the head of our shipping group. So George, we've, we've talked about the potential impact of uh, Brexit on arbitration, but what do you think about the impact uh, in relation to court uh, uh, judgments? Uh, because as well as having a number of maritime disputes going to arbitration, particularly contractual disputes, charter parties, things like this, shipbuilding, um, what do you think uh, is going to be the impact where you have the High Court having jurisdiction, say, in relation to collisions? Will there be uh, the possibility of a successful claimant being able to enforce its High Court judgment against the, the, uh, the, the losing party post-Brexit? Well, at the present time, um, the uh, High Court is often chosen after the event to be a, juris a, a, a forum for the resolution of a dispute. And you you talked about collisions, for example. Um, that's where parties have, you know, have agreed to go forward with that, um, with that forum. At the present time, the recognition of uh, judgments is a mutual reciprocal recognition, which is dealt with through the Brussels Convention, which is an overarching convention, which is agreed by members of the EU um, and one or two parties on the periphery of the EU, such as Norway, where these judgments are recognised mutually by one another. Once we leave the EU, then the position will be changed because we will be no longer a party to that. But it's very likely that the EU and the UK government will reach an agreement so that those judgments are mutually um, recognised in the future. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's also my view, George. I mean, after Brexit, I mean, it's clearly in the interests of EU companies and organisations to be able to enforce within the UK, where there's a lot of banking, there's a lot of assets and inve investment. There's going to be a requirement for them to want to better enforce their judgments in the UK as well. Yeah. So uh, the idea of non-reciprocity between, between the EU and the UK is, I think, difficult to conceive. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a two-way street because you get, uh, you get a, um, a, a, a company which is, has um, its seat in many different jurisdictions around the EU, for example, and they're going to want to bring an action which is always going to be recognised. And it's just not in their interest to allow things not to be uh, enforceable. There would be no point to, uh, to bringing a case in the first place if that were to be the case. One of the questions that's often asked is why are international organisations, companies, businesses attracted to English law and choose it specifically to regulate their, well, their contractual relationships? Well, I think the key factor behind English law, Craig, is the um, flexibility and adaptability of the law to new situations. Um, English law um, evolved commercially to assist traders. Um, it, it, it evolved to assist uh, ship owners trade their ships uh, to carry their cargoes for them to be financed, for them to be insured. And over a period of time, the law has moved with the times. I think if a, a law can allow um, a check to be written on the back of an animal, you can see how it can be adapted um, to deal with um, uh, transactions through e-commerce and things like that, through derivatives, etc., etc. We use basic principles which then apply to a number of different situations. If you take the conclusion of a contract, for example, we've seen that through just you and I talking to one another, through us talking over the telephone, talking through the telegraph, talking through the fax, and now talking through the email. The same law applies the whole time. We don't have a codified system. You just apply the same principles. And it's that adaptability which enables us to look to the future with confidence that we should be able to deal with the new situations arising. And I think that's why we're an attractive centre and an attractive law to people from outside the UK to come here to resolve their disputes. So overall, George, I think reflecting on our conversation, is, is your view, like mine I think it is, to be pretty positive about the future of London as a centre of international maritime arbitration post-Brexit? I definitely think so. I mean, I can't think of a centre which is more outward-looking in terms of the people there. If you look at the arbitrators, the barristers, the judges, 
uh, the, the users, they're all international in their outlook. And therefore, I think that there is just no way that we will be, uh, I can't see how we will not succeed in the future.